You can probably guess I was yelling at the TDL last night. Yeah, it must be him. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> Okay, so here's what we started with yesterday. Um, not a Patriots fan? Are you actually a Falcons fan or are you just hate the Patriots? I really don't really care. Oh, I've seen a great game. Okay, uh, here's what we did yesterday then. So the idea is, can you guys add, subtract, multiply, and divide? Here's a couple different notations you might see. They all kind of refer to the same thing. So you guys feel comfortable with this first kind of intro slide? Okay. So today's topic then is a composition of functions. Um, the best way for me to describe this, by the way, can we skip this example here then? Do you guys feel like you have the hang of how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide them? Right, like here's what we just did. Okay. If I give you a table of values or a graph, all you do is just one point at a time. So you take like this value right here of four, and you'd add it to this value down here. Right. Or you take this value here and add it to that value there. Right. Here, if you're adding it, you know, so you guys get the idea? Or do you want to do another example? Okay, let's move on. The idea behind a composition of functions then is where you don't just use one at a time, you, you use a function and then you immediately do a second one right afterwards. Now, we're not talking adding them to each other, we're talking about taking one and immediately like inputting it somewhere else. Let me give you an analogy. I like this analogy. Let me go to a vending machine. Okay. A vending machine works really well here because you input your coin, so you input your money, you press the buttons on the machine, and it gives you back a chocolate bar. Does that make sense? But now think of it as being you need two machines. Let's say that I'm down in the States and I don't actually have American money. So what I do is I go to the debit machine or the whatever money transfer machine. I put in my debit card first. I type in some buttons and it gives me some American cash. There's the first machine. Does that make sense? And then immediately I take that cash, put it into the, to the vending machine, press the buttons and get the pop. You get the, you get the analogy here? So in, in both cases, I needed to use a machine that transfers something into something else. Because really, that's what a function does. A function takes something and manipulates it into something new. Only rather than just using one of them, I'm going right from one to the next. So here's the example that I've got on the board. Let's say I start with an input of three. And the first machine basically says square. OK, so I did that. Three squared gives you nine. Well, I immediately put it into another machine, and this machine says, take the function and add one. Well, now I get 10. What this then means is that the point 3, 10 is on my graph. Does that make sense? 3 is what I started with, ultimately. 10 is what I finished with by the time I was done, but I had like a middleman step. That's all. So this is me taking my debit card out, getting American cash. American cash into the machine gets me a chocolate bar. That's all. The notation we use then looks like this. It goes G bracket F bracket X. The idea is kind of work your way inwards. I started with three. So like three is like the innermost bracket. I put three into the F machine. And then after I put it into the F machine, then I put it into the G machine last. Can you see how that notation works? Start in the middle. X is what I started with. It got put into the F machine first. And then that got put into the G machine by the time I'm done. Let's try another example. Let's say we didn't start with three. Let's say we started with four. How would that affect things? So let's say it was four instead. If it was four, the first machine says to square it. So then you'd have 16. And then afterwards, you'd add one. So then you'd be up to 17. So 4 would give 17. Does that make sense? We'll do one more. 5. 5, if we started with 5, first you square it. So it would give you 25. And then when you add one more to it, it would give you 26. Okay. This is known as a composition of functions. Now I've got to point something out, though. The order matters greatly. If we start in this machine and go in this direction here, it is completely different than going the other way. Well, let me just describe this to you just verbally. Let's say that I used this machine first too. So let's take the number three that we started with first. If I did three and added one first, that would give you four, and then four squared would give you 16. 
not 10. Let's say I start with 4. 4 plus 1 would give you 5. Then if you squared the 5, you get 25, not 17. If you started with 5, but rather than doing this with the machine, you went backwards, 5 plus 1 would give you 6. Then if you squared it, it would be 36, not 26. So order matters greatly when you take them from one directly into the next. Does that make sense? So uh, my next bunch of slides then are kind of analogies of how this would look. Let's say that you had a, a function of 3x plus 4 and another one of 5x minus 6. What does this notation here mean? Okay. So what this notation means is whatever your x value is, First, make it go into the G machine, then make it go into the F machine. Does that make sense? This means G before F. If I had written it as G bracket F bracket X, if I wrote it that way, this notation means start with the F function and then go to the G function. Is that concept? Uh, the slide I had here, I found this picture. It looks like Dr. Seuss kind of drives. Uh, I think what I was going for with this picture here is just reminding you what a function actually means. A function means you, you take a number, you run that number through the machine, and by the time you're done, you get an answer, right? So like looking at this example here, if the function is, I don't actually know what's that, oh, here it is, 2x plus 1. If number 1 goes through, well, 1 gives you 3. If 2 goes through, 2 gives you 5, 3 gives you 7. Only what we're going to do here is this next slide here. You're going to take the first thing, run it through the machine, and take that immediately through the next machine. That's all. This really get this concept? So let's try some examples somewhere. So um, what we'd like to do then is be able to do this on a one-by-one -one numbered basis. But you know how I kind of started class by talking about how in elementary school you learn how to do just numbers, and we're working our way up to letters and equations. That's what I need you guys to be able to handle here is we need to be able to take equations and shove an entire equation inside another one. So it may just be best if I just do some of these examples to start with and just show you how they're done, and then we can kind of revisit it. So here's what this, this, this function means here is we're going to start with x. We're then going to take g of x as the main thing we do. And then after that, we're going to plug that into f. So if I use that same sort of logic, here's what this means. Just a reminder to our grade sixes who might have been going to Wolfpack basketball tonight. It has been canceled, so there is no Wolfpack sports for grade sixes after school day. Okay, so what this notation means is whatever the x value is, you plug it into the g of x machine. Well, what I'm going to suggest here is see how g of x is kind of written right here, and it is x plus 6. g of x is x plus 6. What I'm going to do is rather than write an unknown variable just on its own, I'm going to say, well, this g of x right here, it is x plus 6. Does that make sense? I'm kind of substituting this right here. Well, then f of x is supposed to be 4x. But I'm not just plugging in x, I'm plugging in, say that's supposed to be 4 times something. But the something is no longer just x. The something is now x plus 6. So our final answer would be this, 4x plus 24. That is our new equation, taking one equation and kind of slicing it inside the next one. Um, why was there a x plus 4 in um, Right here or right here? Above. This one up here? Yeah. Okay, so you see how f of x on its own is supposed to be 4 times x? Okay, but this is actually 4, like the f right here means 4 times something. But we're not doing 4 times x, we're doing 4 g of x's. And since g of x is x plus 6, I basically, I, I triple, I quadruple the x plus 6. Well, let me try some more examples to see how this helps solidify it. So right here, I'm going to start with h of x. h of x on the inside really means take your x number and square it. Now, I don't know what the number is, but I'm going to square whatever number I get, right? So what I'm going to do instead here is I'm going to write g of x squared. Whatever that x was, I would square it first. Now then, what does the g equation say to do? Well, the g equation says to take whatever you have and add 6 to it. 
But we don't have x anymore. What we have now is x squared, which we're going to add 6 to. Do you see how like this and this have now been bumped up to x squareds? Let's try a different example here. I threw a number in the spot instead. I can still do this with the number. It's just going to look a little different in here. This is supposed to be f of 4. Okay, well, what does the f equation say to do? Well, the f equation says to go 4 times x. Only rather than 4 times x, I now know what x is, don't I? So I'm going to write this in as 4 times 4, right? Because it was supposed to be 4x, but I now know that x is 4. That's fine. Now, what does the h equation say to do? Well, the h equation says to take whatever you have and make it squared. So what do we have? Well, we have 4 times 4, right? Because that's what's here. I'm going to square that. In a way, this is a lot of substitution. All right, if you think of the idea of substitution, this 4 is taking the place of this x right here. Then this 4x is going in this place right here. Here's the 4x, only x is now 4. And then this bit in this equation right here, this is not an x. It's actually a 4 by 4 that goes there. So if a 4 by 4 is supposed to go here, a 4 by 4 should also go here. Only one difference here. See how these ones right here provided you an equation? This one here is actually going to provide us a number. Yeah, I believe it's 256. Someone's got a calculator nearby, just confirm that one. <coughs> that makes sense. Okay, so let's try another one h bracket h bracket x. So essentially, we're like it's like we're running it through the same machine twice. I'm going to run it through the first machine, get an answer, and run it through that same machine again. So let's just take just this h of x right here. This h of x is supposed to be x squared. So I will write it as h, h of x. This h of x right here, I'm substituting the x squared in this place. That makes sense. But then I have to do it again. The h of x then says, but it's supposed to be x squared on that. So I have to take my, I don't want to write this here, my x squared, oh, I can write this better. My x squared, that needs to be squared. Does that make sense? The first h of x needs to square it, but the second h of x needs to square it again. So when you square a square, you're going to get x to the fourth. As I do more examples, does it kind of solidify? Okay. Let's do one more normal one, and then we're going to go nuts. This one right here is well beyond what we normally have to do, but if we can follow this crazy one here, you'll know what we're doing. So. Okay, so let's do the exact same thing I was doing here, only there's a number. So that just changes things. We don't have an equation we're doing, we have an answer, like a number. So let's take minus 3 and put it into the f location. So f is supposed to be 4x, so I'm going to write this as 4 times negative 3. Negative 3 takes the place of this guy's x right here, and the 4 times the negative 3 takes the place of this guy here. Then G equation says to take whatever you have in the bracket and add 6 to it. Well, in the bracket, I have that, and I'll add 6 to it. So when we're done, that's minus 12 plus 6. Now you actually get a number number, it's minus 6. Follow this train of thought. Minus 3 is my number, right? So I take minus 3 and plug it into the first equation. 4 times minus 3 gives you minus 12, which is essentially is what this is right here, right? When you have a minus 12, you then plug that into the second equation. So minus 12 plus 6, well, this is the minus 12, plus 6 is minus 6. That makes sense? Let's try the crazy one. By the way, just so you guys know, you, I've never seen anything that intense like this on a diploma. Uh, I have seen them put like three or four of them together, but to put like six of them together is ridiculous. So let's do it one at a time. I need g of f of h of g. See, I'm kind of like working my way in. And then the very, very last one is fx. So f of x is supposed to be 4x. So I'm just taking the f of x, and I'm putting a 4x in its spot, and then I'm going to need, let's see, 
four closed brackets now. So far, so good? Okay, now let's deal with G, because that's the next one up. So I'm going to rewrite everything up until G. So G, F, H. But then write, rather than writing G, I'm going to write whatever G's equation is. So G's equation is supposed to be X plus 6. But rather than it being X plus 6, it's now going to be 4X plus 6, because the 4X is taking the place of the X. And then now I only need three closed brackets. Oh wait, for the next slide, I'm going to rewrite the same starting bit, except now I'm dealing with H. What's the rule for H? Well, H says whatever you have in brackets, square it. That's what the rule for H is, right? Whatever X you have in brackets, square that number. What do we have in brackets? Well, we have 4X plus 6 in brackets. So let's take 4X plus 6 and square it. Then for the F, what does the F function mean to do? Well, the F function means for whatever you have in the brackets, times it by 4. What is in our brackets? Well, this mess is in our brackets, so we have to take this mess and times it by 4. Last one. Now we have to do G. The G function means whatever you have in brackets, whatever your value was, to that value, add 6. Okay. But we don't have x in the brackets anymore. We have this whole big schmoz of stuff, right? So take that schmoz of stuff and add 6 to it. There's our final answer. We finally worked our way through it. That makes sense. So it's a big series of substitutions. Did you just forget that the 4x could be just an x anymore? Right here? Uh, the one on the bottom. The one on the bottom here? Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. There should be a 4x plus 6 in there, isn't there? Good catch, thank you. Good catch. Because I, I stopped continuing. Yeah. Because the idea is that what you have should keep going down every time. So, one more time. The x became 4x. That got rid of the f right there. The g becomes something plus 6, so I just added a 6 to it. The h means to square it, so it takes that thing and square it. Then the next one over means to times that whole thing by 4. And then once it times it all by 4, then I add the 6 to the end of it. Okay, so let's talk about some of the terminology for this. This is known as a composite function, where you basically you take one function and it kind of slides inside the next one, where one goes right to the next to the next. So here's how we say it. I actually probably was saying it uh, while we were doing these last examples here. Verbally, you read it as f of g of x. Like if you see these brackets here, you call it f of g of x. That's how you read it. So like when I say these out loud, I'll just erase some of these here. I would say like verbally, this is called f of g of x. This is called g of h of x. H of f of four. That's how you say it. Does that make sense? Okay. And then the other thing I need you guys to know is the two different ways that you can notate it. You can notate it as like f bracket g bracket x, which is what I was showing you guys. Now, f bracket g bracket x is one way of doing it, but the other way is like this. I believe the O stands for of. Now, this is not like a dot or a multiply sign. It's like an open circle. So this means the exact same thing. Rather than going f bracket g bracket f, f bracket g bracket x, you can go f. O-G-X. It means the same thing. 
So if you see FOG, it means do the G function first, then do the F function. So you're kind of doing it like in reverse order. So like start on the inside and build your way outside. And the last thing I have here is that FOGX does not mean multiply them. Some kids think that like the dot means multiply. If it was just, just a dot, like F dot G, that is different than F O G. So that's the notation we use. Sound good? Okay, let's try some more examples. Let's try to figure out the domain of these functions here. Let's try to like put them together. So this notation right here is a fancy different way of writing G bracket F bracket X. So here's how I might approach it. I'll start on the inside. What is F of X supposed to be? Well, here I have F of X, and F of X is supposed to be X minus 1. So I could write this as G of X minus 1 and have the f of x basically transfer into the x minus 1. See how that works? But then g, the rule for g is whatever is in brackets, you get negative that number squared. But we don't just have x in brackets anymore. We have x minus 1 in brackets. So this should be negative the stuff in brackets squared. the formula. Negative, whatever the number is squared, only the number now is x to the minus 1. Okay, i got to clean this up a bit. Do you guys know what happens with these exponents? What do you do with them? Remember your exponent rules from like grade 10 or 11 or something like that? Those ones you multiply. Quick refresh. So just off to the side. If you have x to the 3 times by x to the 2, that is x to the 5. Okay. But if you have x to the 3 bracket to the 2, that's the 6. Okay. The reason why here is you have three x's. This one has two x's. And you're basically, you're just like, well, I should use some x's at the time side. And you're just like, you're continuing the list, if that makes sense. Whereas x to the 3 squared means you have three x's. Squaring it means you have three more. So once you know that rule here, these guys right here, we're going to multiply them. So we're going to have negative x to the minus 2. That will be our final equation. Do you guys, though, recall what a negative exponent means? That'll work if you're talking um, scientific notation. It puts it on the bottom of the fraction. Do you guys recall the rule like x to the minus 1 means 1 over x? You guys recall this rule? So x to the minus 2 means what we actually have is 1 over x squared. That's what this is. x to the negative m is like 1 over x to the n. You, you basically you throw that number on the bottom. Um, you know, you, I think you were trying to go with like um, scientific notation how the negative makes itself, but this actually is, that's what it does. It's dividing by however many you have. So like you know how if you have like x to the minus four, it means you're dividing by ten four times, which makes the number smaller. So they they kind of do fit together. Let's get to our question though. We want to find the domain of this thing. So one thing I haven't talked much about so far is how domain and range works on this. Domain is your inputs. So think back to your vending machine analogy. Um, you, you can't always input everything. So, sometimes you can, but there are some functions where so there are certain things that you cannot input as a value. What is the one x value you could never use here? Yes. Does that make sense? If I give you 1, 2, 3, 17, 42, negative 5, all those are valid, but there is one input you cannot use, it would be 0. You can't use 0. So there's a couple ways that you might write this. Um, if I were to ask you what the domain is, you might say like x is an element of the reals, but that x can't be 0. Have we done stuff like that before where we kind of write our domain statement? That's like the one thing you can't use. If you were to think of like a, uh, a vending machine then, you know how you have to put money in a vending machine to get something back, right? You can use quarters, you can use loonies, you can use tunies. 
but this vending machine does not accept nickels. That makes sense. Like there's just there's one thing that it cannot accept. That's all. All right, let's try some more examples. This is going backwards now. Let's say that I give you a function that is supposed to be a composite. What I'm going to ask you guys to do now is figure out what it maybe was made of before it got pieced together. So this is kind of a reverse thinking here. So what I'm telling you is that this h of x function right here is equal to something that was broken into pieces. What are those pieces? There's really no work to this. Either you kind of see it or you don't. The g of x is like the, the one that gets substituted. That's going to be x minus 2. See how like there's an x minus 2 in both of these brackets right here? Kind of what has it, I guess, as to what the f of x would have been done. If I show you the answer, you'll see it. This notation here means take the g of x equation and put it inside the f of x equation. So see how you have this f of x equation here? I wrote it at x squared plus x plus 1. What I'm doing is I'm taking this guy right here and I'm putting them both of those spots right there, which gives me the x minus 2 squared bit the x minus 2 bit right here on the plus 1. You have to visualize that backwards. Let's try the next one. Where is there like something inside of something else? Where is the something that's inside? That'll work. Okay, so let's make that the g of x. Let's make the x cubed plus 1 be something that's inside something else. So replace it. What, what, what is the function that it is inside of that it's going to substitute in this place of? Like that, yes. Does that make sense? Do you guys remember what these lines stand for, by the way? Absolute value, yeah. It just means that you can't have negative sense. So if you can picture this, what we've done is we've taken this and we put it into that guy's location. Makes sense. Okay. okay, well, now let's try something much more challenging. When we began this kind of series of lessons, I actually began with graphs. And when you were adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, I think it's actually very easy to look at the graph and figure out how to add and subtract them. Because all we did in the past, like say for adding, is we took this value and this value and we added them together. And we took this value and this value and we added them together. However, when you do composites of functions, it doesn't quite work in that same sort of way. And I'm willing to wager, I mean, not a lot of money, I'm not gambling on this, but like what I'm trying to say here, you guys, you're going to get a question like this in the form, but they always throw it on me like this. Because it, it takes quite a bit of reasoning to A, you have to know what this notation means. And then B, you have to know even how to use the graph. So let's do this one point at a time. You know how like on the graph we just kind of started here and picked an x value? Pick an x value. I don't care which one. We just need to start with one. One. Thank you for someone saying something. So let's say x was one. So you see how right here I've kind of found the line where x is equal to one? Somewhere along there. Which one do we need to start with? The f graph or the g graph? Okay. So on the g graph, which is the red graph, what's the value there at 1? Negative 0.5. That makes sense? So what I could say is that if g of x, that's negative 0.5. And now I have to take that negative 0.5 and I have to plug it into the f equation. Well, you know how in the past we always had like a line that was always consistent? It's no longer consistent. Now that's like my new input. So the red line input was 1. It gave me an output of negative 0.5. 
I now need to put a line right here where my new x value is now negative 0.5 and see what that does on the blue line. And on the blue line, that puts me right here at negative 2.5. So it means that the point one gives me negative two and a half. Let me try that again. This is why I always lose this I'll make a table of dice. So start with one. When I plug 1 into the g equation, here's the line for where x is 1 on the g equation. So far, so good. It gives me an output of negative 0.5. So an input gave me an output. But that output is about to be turned right back into an input, right? Think of those like two machines back to back. It goes from here to here, and then it goes right into the next machine. So Although I did have a temporary in-between output of negative 0.5, I now need to make that a new input, which means I need to consider where negative 0.5 is as kind of an x value. And it, on this graph right here, gives me an output then of negative 2 now. So 1 gave negative 0.5, but negative 0.5 gave, neg gave negative 2 now. So there's my point on the graph. So if I actually want to plot that point now, which is challenging. One, get negative two and a half. There's a point there. Let's try a few more. There, we'll do lots. Give me another x value to work with. Can we go in order or something? We can go, we can go with four, but two seems like a good choice. We'll get there. <laughs> Jump all the way to four. Okay. So, first thing we got to do then is consider what four, what 2 does as an input. On the g of x graph, if you input 2, what do you get back as an output? 0. It doesn't actually matter which graph we do, but either way it was 0. Well, now 0 is now your new input. So now we need to put 0 on here, and we need to use it on the f line. So 0 on the f line actually gives us negative 2. So 2 gives negative 2. Chain of events, 2 gave 0, 0 gave negative 2. So I'm plotting that point here, 2 is <coughs> negative 2. Let's try 3. Then we go. Alright, 3 on the graph here. G of 3. What happens when you put 3 into the G line? The G line is right here in red. When you plug in 3, it gives you a half. Does that work? So 3 as an input gives a half as an output. But that one half output becomes a new input right here. This is now where a half would go. How does a half then work on the F line, which is the blue line. That gives negative 1.5. Make sense? Can we go follow this? Let's try one more. And then I'm going to try uh, some more examples in different varieties. Four. The input four. Four is along this line right here. We take the g value of four, which is one. So four gives one. What would one give for the other line? Right here, it would give you negative one. I actually think that's a pattern here. Does that make sense? Can you just find your assignment real quick? I want to do one of the questions off your assignment with you.
Let's do one C now. We did one A and B at some point. Or at least I probably didn't time to work on one A and B. Let's do one C and talk about what this means here. I'm now asking you to do f of g of f of 4. Where do you start? Start with a 4. You define what f of 4 is. Well, when x is 4, what is f of 4? 0. Does that work? 0 is now your new input. So now we want to know g of zero. So now you have to kind of take this zero right here and remake it to that zero and find what g of zero is. g of zero would be one. So now all of this up to here is now one. Then I want to know what f of one is. So you take this one and kind of bring it over to here and make this one and find what f is, which is five. So long story short, if you input 4 through the machines, it eventually gives you 5. One more time. This 4 right here gives you that 0. Well then, that 0 gives this 1, and that 1 gives this 5. Can I follow how that works? As soon as you get the output, you return it back into an X number to make it an input. Let's try one of these ones on number four. Now, we have to do these kind of one at a time. Let's do the uh, D one right here. G bracket F bracket X. I think I have one big bracket section. Now, in a situation like this, we just need to pick a number to start with. So, let's start with 1. Let's do f of 1. Well, if you start with 1 for f, it gives you 1 for y. Then you have to do g of that. Well, here's the 1 for g. It will give you 2. So, the point on your graph is 1 gave 2. Really, in a way, 1 gave 1, and that 1 gave 2. So ultimately, 1 gave 2. Let's try another value. 2. What is f of 2? Well, if you plug in 2, it gives you 3. And then on the g equation, 3 gives you 5. So in a way, 2 gave 3, but 3 gave 5, so your final answer is 2, 5. So it doesn't matter what you do? We have to do all of them that are possible, so then pick another input value. 3, then, you do next. 3 would give 0. 0 would give you 3. Okay, now, why am I stopping there? Is there a possibility of trying 4? Is there an input of 4 on this guy right here? It's not valid. So that's like in my vending machine. I can plug in literally and tunies and quarters, but it won't accept nickels or dimes. So in terms of inputs, the only ones logically to try are 1, 2, and 3, because they're the only ones that I actually have inputs for. If I try using 0, the, the graph doesn't exist there. I would say the concept for composite functions, although confusing to do, the concept is very straightforward. Take a function, shove it inside the other one, basically. That's all you're doing, right? Like, you use this, you get an answer, immediately plug it into the next one. Possibly plug it into another string of them, right? But in practice, this becomes very challenging, because I need you guys to be able to do this with an equation, which I've shown you some of. I need you to be able to do it with a graph. Graphs may be the hardest of all of them. I need you to be able to do it with a table of values and know how to apply this concept across a variety of different applications. Does that make sense? So, okay, let's start for example. I've got to be getting close to being done, right? Oh, one last one. Okay. Um, 
But I'll actually let's just talk through what this the difference is here. Is f bracket g bracket x the same as g bracket f bracket x? No, the order makes a huge difference. Let's just do one or two points just to illustrate it here. So here we had one, two, three, four. Let's do the same points. All right, so plug this into the first machine. If you plug one into the first machine, now we want to start with the F machine, though. So by starting with the F machine, we actually want it to be negative one. So in a way, one <laughs> will give us negative one. But we're not done, though. Right? We then take negative one and see what it does on the other graph, which is now the red graph. Negative one gives negative one and a half, I believe, because that's where that one is. So in a way, one went with negative one on one graph, but then negative one gave negative one and a half on the other graph. So final answer, one gave negative one and a half. And if we were to plot it, it doesn't get plotted over here, which is what most kids get started with, because they feel like, well, this is where I finished. But you have to do the right input-output scenario. So 1, negative 1 and a half actually ends up being right here. It's not on either graph. Does that make sense? Okay, one more, and I'll call it Let's try two. What will 2 give? Zero. 0 either way, right? Either way gives 0. OK, well now 0 needs to be the input for the G graph. So 0 would be right along the axis. The G graph is the red one, so it gives negative 1. So the point we plot is 2, negative 1, which goes right here. Which again, kids find frustrating because they think the point should be right there. But that's not the point you plot. The point you plot is actually over here. So, okay, quick summary, and then I'll call it quits because we're almost done with it. Think of a function as a machine. You input and output. Okay. Uh, rules could be things like take your number and add one. That would be the function x plus one. But what I could ask you to do with these composite functions is before you're done, take your apples to your lemons but immediately take the lemons and go to oranges. In a way, it's like you start with an x value. The x value gives you a y value. That y value you just pretend is an x value so that you can then turn it into another y value. And ultimately, your answer then is this x and this y. And these guys are kind of just a little switch in between. Or if you like my analogy, this is you starting with your debit card and you get some American money, but then you immediately take your American money and put it into a vending machine. Does that make sense? So your input gives you an output, but then your output becomes an input to go somewhere else. Okay. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. I think you'll find the concept, <laughs> I think the concept is not hard. It's just, can you apply it to questions? That's what kids really struggle with. Because especially on the diploma, they find so many unique and interesting ways to kind of challenge you with this. So, okay, uh, that's all I got. Um, start working on your assignment, I guess. That's kind of your big thing now. So try the assignment. You should be able to do the rest of it. Sound good? All right, you can go take a break if you need. By the way, I know I talked for quite a while there. It was Forty-five minutes.